Pan 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 Psycast. Part two, the solutions. I just want to clarify something I said in last week's instalment. I was saying that breadcrumbs lead to a gingerbread house, <laughs> and it's gingerbread crumbs to a gingerbread house. Don't want to be accused of spreading false information. Don't want to start any unnecessary conspiracy theories <laughs> because they're bloody dangerous. <laughs> so let's talk about the dangers of conspiracy theories. Some people think that conspiracy theories take on an important task. It They serve as the sceptics of society. The status quo, the obvious official view, we can challenge it. It's good to be sceptical, right? You're going to go buy a new car. Be sceptical. Kick the wheels. Steal the guy's wallet and check he's got identification and that he's worth buying a car off. Maybe it's not great in all scenarios. You're trying to convince a room full of people that a horrific event like a genocide occurred. Maybe scepticism isn't as appropriate there. So... In this first section, I want to carve out the line of when skepticism is appropriate and not, and the dangers of when it isn't appropriate. Great. So should we use a case study to help us understand this? So I can give you guys a case study, a conspiracy theory, okay? And you can maybe add some skepticism or see where you stand on it. So during my research, I was trying to find the first conspiracy theory. Now, I'm sure that the first conspiracy theory was probably produced by some kind of cave people, right? It was probably Ugg Ugg Rock moved on its own or something like that. So we don't have any mm. record of that, I'm afraid, dear listeners. So I'm sorry about that. But the first written account of conspiracy theories that I could find anyway, unless you guys found a different one, was the Great Fire of Rome, which happened on the 19th of July in our year 64 CE. Have you guys heard of this before? I mean, I've heard of the event, but not the conspiracy. Yeah, I think you mentioned it off microphone until the second, but I'll pretend for the sake of the recording. Yeah, it's new to me. Thanks for playing along, Jack. So let's go for <laughs> the Great Fire of Rome then. So annual Roman games, guys quarter of a million people packed into the Circus Maximus in the center of Rome, okay? Many stands outside this arena would be like fast food joints we'd have today, right? So you'd have like your Subway, your other brand here, all of the shops with their little fires going ready for all the people coming out of the, the stadium. On the 19th of July, it was an exceptionally hot day, very, very hot, obviously in the middle of summer, and it was a very windy day. Now, apparently what happened was one of these little stoves fell over and caught fire. Apparently this was quite common. This happened all the time. There's a fire, the fire then spreads, and it becomes a really bad fire. This fire lasts a week. It affects the lives of countless people. Nearly two-thirds of the city is reduced to ashes, and half of the city's population loses their homes. So it is a big, big deal. The Roman historian Tacitus was there. He was about five years old at the time and witnessed a lot of this fire. And he said you could literally see mobs of people running around, quote, fanning the flames and shouting that they were working for the emperor at the time, who was Nero. And this began a conspiracy of gossip that actually Emperor Nero was responsible for the fire, that he started it on purpose. So, from what we've got so far, what do we think? With our sceptical heads on, what do we think about the Great Fire of Rome so far, anyway? What are we thinking, Jack? I thought in the first section of this, we were picking out the dangers of conspiracy theories. So perhaps when we analyze where conspiracies go wrong and how we can respond to them later on, we can pick out exactly why someone holding the belief that the Great Fire was a conspiracy, why they would be irrational to hold such a view and how we could respond to them if they did hold the view. But in terms of the dangers, my immediate thought is, well, if somebody thinks that Nero did cause the Great Fire, there's a number of problems here, right? The first one, the most obvious one seems to me from a philosophical point of view that it's an obstacle to knowledge and it detracts from the true problem. We need fire regulations. We need to make sure we've got houses built far apart from each other. We're not using flammable materials. So it's actually detracts from the real problem that we need to solve. In the same way in 9-11 conspiracies, the real conspiracy is the one that George Bush, on his gut, thinks there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and, and we follow them in there. That's the real problem, illegal wars. So when someone focuses on a fake problem, such as it was an inside job, then not only does it make George Bush's critics look like lunatics, but it also distracts us from the actual problem. So this looks like another example of that, right? Absolutely. I think we can definitely see the proportionality bias affecting here, right? This big event that levels two thirds of the city 
there must be a conspiracy behind this. And even quite respected Roman historians believe this. So Suetonius, who was actually born after the fire had happened, he wrote a history of Rome. And he says that Nero actually watched the city burn from his tower, the the Mencius it's called, and he was hypnotized by the flames singing a song called the Sack of Ilium. So taking delight in watching his citizens burn and all of the chaos. Cassius Dio, who's writing 160 years later than Suetonius, even embellishes it even more and has Nero playing a lyre, kind of playing himself a song called The Capture of Troy, and that he actually deliberately paid people to burn the city on purpose so he could sit and watch. According to the historical records, if we go back to Tacitus for a second, he actually says that, well, Nero wasn't even in the city when it was on fire. He was actually 36 miles out of the city. And as soon as he heard about the fire, he actually came back and tried to set up homeless shelters and stuff like that for the people. But it didn't stop this rumor of Nero being this malicious, horrible emperor spreading. And he actually had a very bad reputation through many historians and through many centuries because of Suetonius and Cassius Dio's account of the matter. And we could even say that they're almost like the info wars of their time. They're dramatic writing, they're using gossip, and they get lots of people reading. It's very dramatic, right? Like, what's more exciting? Well, Nero was just having a holiday and it was just a fire. Or actually, no, he was on top of the tower singing a, a dastardly song, you know, laughing as the flames, you know, engulfed his city. I think that there's quite a little uh, interesting tip there. I'm sure you're going to tell us, Jack, how the dangers in that as well. Another one to modernize it slightly, you think of Al Gore losing against Bush in the election, stolen election in Florida, you think the same this year with the Trump administration losing to Biden and again, the stolen election. So the danger seems to be that once you get somebody on board with a conspiracy, with a particular way of thinking, you don't have any idea. I think the guy who created QAnon says something like, these are just the breadcrumbs. You have no idea how big this thing gets. So once you open the door to conspiracy, you can get your followers to commit some pretty huge atrocities. See Adolf Hitler and uh, Mein Kampf and and during the Second World War, the atrocities committed during the Holocaust. So the danger seems to be is that once you make somebody suspicious of a point of view, you can collapse any contrary evidence into your conspiracy and commit dreadful things in the name of quote unquote justice, which are unfounded and irrational, right? I want to change direction slightly here and think about how this might affect kind of everyday citizen. We've just talked about Emperor Nero and Bush and Biden and Trump, all political leaders who are above and beyond the average person. So there's a couple of things here, and and actually I can touch upon some of the things that Jack's said. One of the things I think is evident, and particularly in the time we're living in right now, is the importance of trusting expertise particularly medical expertise. So you can imagine how somebody, and this is where things like the anti-vaxxer conspiracies come to the forefront. And you have a person who realizes there is a threat perhaps to themselves, more importantly, maybe for them, their children, and that they want to trust their doctors and that they go to the doctors and they get told that we highly recommend that your child has this vaccine. But if they then go online and they explore a couple of things about this vaccination and they come across some conspiracy theories against it, is that suddenly their trust in the doctor's testimony has eroded slightly and that now they're slightly uncertain about what they felt very confident about before. And that after they've done that, then they're left with this ambiguous state of not sure where to go with. And all it takes is just a few more of those things to erode and for their continuous reading. And maybe they join a group on Facebook, which also is full of like-minded parents who are just there to protect their children. And suddenly they don't give their child a vaccine. And that is surprisingly common. And there are people with things like in the UK, measles vaccines where there are evidence beginning to crop up in the last decade, I think, where people who weren't given the vaccine uh, we're now seeing in isolated areas, but measles beginning to become a problem for some people where actually for those people who got vaccinated, it isn't a problem at all. And of course, now we're, we're in the perspective of living through a pandemic. And you can imagine what difficult problems this faces where there are certain communities of people for I presume many different reasons who are lacking in trust in medical experts and they risk a long future of difficulties if the right information doesn't get to them in the right way. 
And medicines and vaccines, I think, are a really fascinating way into this idea of conspiracy theories because it's really hard to see their success through history, right? So I found this statistic from the WHO, which said between the year 2000 and the year 2003, so three years, 15 million people had their lives saved by the MMR vaccine, which is an obscene amount of people. That is so many. But you would never know that unless you found out that statistic, right? And some people might question that statistic, like Andy said. But again, you don't see the immediate benefits of that. Whereas one story of an MMR vaccine giving somebody autism can like spread through social media or spread through the media full stop. And that good core, you know, I love my child, I want to protect my child, that good instinct is then kind of overrides the facts then. The anti-vax movement goes back to the creation of the first vaccine with smallpox. I mean, there were people that were literally saying, if you vaccinate people, it goes against God's rules. You shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. It's not a new thing. But, you know, California having to be the first, like, first world country in, like, 50 years that had an outbreak of measles, and it's one of the richest places in the world, does come across as very strange. I want to go back a second and actually think about the idea of knowledge as well in this whole thing. So we painted this picture of somebody going to a, a doctor and asking about these things. And Kasim Kassam in his book talks about the fact that when you go in and you trust the person and that they have expertise, is that they say the vaccine is important, it will save your child, is that if you feel confident in that belief and you have the right to be confident in it, then we can say on one particular picture of epistemology that you could safely say what you have there is knowledge because it's true, it's a true belief held with confidence and you have right to be confident because it can be proved by a source which is again, confident in its belief. And it's about then, like once one of those things has been taken away, then suddenly the whole idea of knowledge crumbles apart. And so obviously, if something's just simply not true, then you can't have knowledge. But if your confidence, and this is what's happening here, if your confidence is eroded, then suddenly you don't have knowledge anymore. What you have is this confusion of, I don't know what to believe. So it's really important that people feel confident that they know what is true and not simply just giving people information. There's a bunch of things there which I thought were interesting. I think we can draw them out a little bit when we move away from dangers and into the mistakes that, or the types of thinking that conspiracy theorists employ. But one thing to pull out immediately is that the definitions in these books we've read on conspiracy theories of what knowledge is tell us something glaringly true that not even philosophers and epistemologists can agree on what knowledge is. So the average person walking about who's dealing with a conspiracy theory is going to find it really difficult to know where the bar is. And like you say, Andrew, once you've threw out loads of pieces, imagine it's like you're dealing with a conspiracy theorist, you're arguing against them, they'll throw out loads of pieces, scatter them all over the floor and say, solve all of these problems, right? It's a big distraction, all of these skeptical things. But one thing to say is that pretty much every single view has problems it needs to solve. Right? Pretty much every single view has a question that can be asked of it. That's the very nature of skepticism. And all of these conspiracy theories seem to ask questions or pose problems to views. But it's not a matter that just because the view faces a problem doesn't make it less reasonable than the view which you're proposing. Yes, there is clearly people who have different views on epistemology and what true knowledge actually is. But I think for the average person, one doesn't need to study in-depth philosophy and get worried about Gettya problems where they think they look at a clock and they believe that the time is one thirty two, <laughs> but the clock's actually stopped and that it isn't one thirty two at all. And so you have this problem. Therefore, lizard people. <laughs> I think just having a basic foundation of, okay, like well, let's not worry about the nitty gritty of what is true in its most fine, refined sense and just have these things. And I think what Kazam offers there is reasonable. And just one more point on that. He talks about the idea of, well, this still creates a problem of how do we decide what to trust? Because if so much of our beliefs about things are reliant on testimonial knowledge and that somebody having expertise tells us what is true, let's face it, in the modern world, there's so much information out there and we specialize in such tiny minutia that almost everything, and I can speak this confidently about myself, almost everything that I think is true is based on the idea that somebody told me that it's true and I don't have the time or the expertise to find it. So how do I know that I'm going to find the right person? And just to link this into what we're talking about here about the problems of conspiracy theories is that it again erodes this problem of who is the person who I should trust? Is it the people who are giving me this or give me that? And I guess without going too much into the combating these things, but I think being able to look at whether or not the person has respected qualifications is clearly an important thing. 
Do they have the right kind of experience? And do they have the testimony of others who also have expertise that back them up? So when I go to a doctor, I expect them to have a medical degree. I expect them to have practiced medicine for a particular time, presumably while they're training and before they get to their degree. And obviously they need to have the actual testimony of people who helped train them to know that they are good. And only then will I trust a doctor. But I assume that any doctor I see in this country fulfills that criteria. So somebody better be giving me a really, really good reason for why I should distrust them. And so this is where conspiracy theories cause the big problem is that for some people, and perhaps just Again, for all sorts of reasons, they might lead to become to distrust medical professionals. And then suddenly there's a foot in the door there where conspiracy theories can continue to erode that trust. And Andy's using a very specific example there of an anti-vaxxer and a doctor, but let's try and keep it a bit more simple. So this idea that there's things in the world that we may not understand and we are reliant on others for their expertise is something we really need to focus on, I think. So, Jack, have you ever used a can opener? Uh, yeah, I have. I don't think I own. Yeah, I do own one. Sorry, go on. Can you tell me and Andy how a can opener works? Yeah, that's why I was struggling because I tend to buy the ones with the ring pulls on there because I always <laughs> struggle to do it properly. But you know, you pop it on the side, it's got a blade, it's got like a wheel, you clamp it on, you turn the wheel and the wheel goes around the can and the blade follows the can opener and cracks it open, right? Is that... I mean, kind of. I mean, can you maybe go into a bit more depth on the physics of the pressure of how it works? <laughs> depth? Yeah, so, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right. And I think that people will use like weird examples that we'll go like, doctors, medicine, we'll talk about smartphones, but a can opener or a bicycle. Actually, under pressure, how does a bicycle work? How does its chain actually attach to the wheels and how does it go forward? Now, we think we know how it works and we have an intuition because I've ridden a bike, I've opened a can, you've opened a can, Andy's opening a can right now. But actually, under pressure, we don't really know. We think we do, but we don't. So actually, we do have to appeal to others' expertise probably more often than we, even with everyday objects and things we encounter, than we would like to admit, I think. There's that meme of like a person who travels back in time to impress everybody with their knowledge. And then somebody just asking them a really trivial question and them having absolutely <laughs> no idea what they're talking yeah. about. Yeah, look at this smartphone. Uh, have you got a charger? Oh, we haven't invented electricity yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I would be one of those people. If I was to go back in time, could I offer anything that would like revolutionize the way that they live? And the answer to that is I have ideas, but I'm no expert when it comes to engineering. So I don't think I would be able to offer a great deal. There's a brilliant essay by uh, Venkatesh Rao, Welcome to the Future Nausea, which I recommend. He talks about this problem of we have everything normalized for us. We don't know how everything works and how that's a problem existentially. I recommend that. But we're moving quite away here, as I imagine you suspect. So I just want to emphasize the facts that conspiracy theories are dangerous. They're physically dangerous in that they can harm thousands of people, hundreds of people, millions of people. So take the Christchurch killings in New Zealand, which was recent in that 50 people lost their lives in two mosques. And the man who committed the atrocity a quote, the birth rates must change in his quote unquote manifesto. He was worried that the black and brown communities were trying to outnumber whites because of the birth rates there. They take the Unite the Right rally of white supremacists in, in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, walking around and we all remember them chanting, Jews will not replace us. How absurd, right? Like, there's no evangelism in Judaism. Like, there's only like 15 million Jews. That's 0.2% of the whole world population. So obviously what they meant there was that they were appealing to that right-wing white supremacist conspiracy theory, which is typically anti-Semitic. And what we haven't emphasized is so many of these conspiracy theories are anti-Semitic. So although you might not think you're an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist, I think this is brought up in a few of the sources that we read. Often you're guilty by association in the same way if I was supposed to fly a Confederate flag in my garden if I was in the US, right? I might think that I'm displaying it for reasons that I'm proud of my Southern heritage. But what I can't take away is the meaning somebody else has put in that. And likewise, although I think this is Kassam, 17% of male smokers end up with cancer. Well, a lot of conspiracy theorists who adopt the type of thinking we're about to discuss will end up being anti-Semitic or being radicalized as well. So you're in danger of that. Yeah, so so far we've talked about, we mentioned Emperor Nero, so what's the harm of conspiracy theories? It can ruin the reputation of an emperor or politician. Andy's mentioned anti-vaxxers, which is much more immediate. You know, this is really harmful in the sense that you could potentially really harm a society or a population through them not being vaccinated. 
And I want to pick up on what Jack's mentioning there about anti-Semitism and go into a much more malicious form of the harm of conspiracy theories. So there was a pamphlet that was published in a Russian newspaper in 1903. This newspaper was called The Banner, and it was called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. It was a piece of anti-Semitic propaganda. It was apparently produced in Paris and cobbled together from fictitious stories like Pulp Fiction and given a very anti-Semitic twist and put together and published in this newspaper. This conspiracy theory, we will call it, talks about the idea that Jewish people are in control of the media in Russia, that Jewish people are trying to infiltrate into different countries all over Europe and America and Russia, and they want to control the governments and have a big impact. And it is all completely fictitious. It is not true, not based on any Jewish scriptures, not based on the Hebrew Bible. It is completely made up and false. But here we have a really interesting example of how bad ideas spread They spread quickly and they deeply embed themselves. So we also have stereotypes of Jewish people being really rich and greedy and all that sort of thing. And what's interesting here is there was someone who was a really, really big fan of this pamphlet, and that was obviously Adolf Hitler. He made the protocols of the learned elders of Zion compulsory reading in German schools from 1933. It was a compulsory part of the curriculum, and he often referred to it in his speeches. It was often encouraged in UK newspapers too, so the Times published it as well as fact. Henry Ford in America said as well that he believed most of it to be true. And here we have incredibly harmful, dangerous stereotypes about Jewish people being spread around the world. And you can see that as a precursor to what would eventually become the Holocaust, where you have six million Jewish people that are treated horrendously by the Nazis and executed. Uh, In the words of Norman Cohen, he says that pamphlet is a, quote, a preposterous fabrication expressly designed to appeal to all the paranoid and destructive potentialities in human beings and become nothing less than a warrant for genocide. You can see how this conspiracy theory was deliberately made to harm people and encourage anti-Semitic feelings, which eventually is one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the precursors to the Holocaust, which led to the Mm. extermination of six million Jewish people. I think it's very hard to look at that evidence and then say, oh, conspiracy theories, they're just a bit of fun, right? They don't really harm anyone. Just, Just let them believe they're crazy things. Actually, no, these ideas latch on. I mean, even some of my students, I will talk to some of my students about the stereotypes of Jewish people, and sometimes they will think the stereotypes are true. They will think that Jewish people are richer or lazy or greedy, right? And actually, those bad ideas still exist and they still spread. Looking at that evidence, you can see how, and you can see that actually, yes, these conspiracy theories are incredibly dangerous. The radical links are really strong, as we all found. If that mysterious person behind the scenes, it very often is Jewish, is Muslim, is a Christian attacking or wanting to destroy Islam, Al-Qaeda, this is uh, one of the conspiracy theories which they uh, embrace. So it's no surprise that some of the biggest atrocities in human history, such as the Holocaust, are guided by certain conspiracy theories like the ones we've just discussed. But also, a little bit more mundane, you might think, in our everyday lives, is if we hold a conspiracy theory like Elvis isn't dead, or Avril Lavigne was taken away, or something along those lines. You might think, they're not that dangerous, right? But one thing which came to mind when I was reading this was that Wilfred uh, Clifford's essay, The Will to Believe, from 1896. I'll give you a little example here. So Clifford gives the example of a ship owner who is going to send it on a voyage, let's say, from the United States to the United Kingdom. And the ship's a little bit creaky, and he thinks, oh, it might not make it. And he holds that thought in his head. But he sends the people out on the ship anyway, and the ship sinks, collects the insurance, no harm done for him anyway. This is clearly morally wrong, right? He holds a belief which he keeps to himself, he doesn't share and something bad happens. But then Clifford says, even if the ship arrives safely, he's still guilty, he's still done something that's morally wrong. He knew that it was not shipworthy, yet he held it to himself. So even when we hold conspiracy theories and don't share them, we might have a sort of epistemic responsibility, and this is the field of philosophy, the ethics of belief, that we've got a moral responsibility to have correct beliefs. How can that affect us in everyday life? Well, I might be deeply sexist or racist or misogynistic or anti panpsychist right? And I might say, hey, don't worry, I'm a proper liberal, and that will never affect my <laughs> views. Like, I can believe homosexuality is not okay and run for be prime minister. Oh, wait, no, I can't, right? Because it's going to seep out somehow in my behavior. I'm not that strongly in control of the processes in my mind. And so it will come out in some sense. 
So perhaps there's an argument to say we've got a responsibility to sort out any bad thinking, because the bad thinking we do is a sort of template that can very much be filled by a more radical ideology. You can think about this in very simple ways as well, just about the truth. You know, people often say the truth will always come out. You know, you, you can lie and you can pretend and even, you know, lie to yourself. You can make yourself ignorant by not informing yourself. But also, I mean, let's take an example like, I mean, I'm a little bit of a person who's obsessed with the Chernobyl nuclear disaster that happened in the 1980s. And part of the reason that was such a destructive event was the fact that the Russian government refused to acknowledge what actually happened. They lied to themselves and pretended that actually, no, there wasn't an open nuclear reactor. It was just a broken hydrogen tank. And actually, you know, there wasn't a serious problem to the point where if nothing was done, you could have had a nuclear meltdown that could have made most of Eastern Europe unhospitable. And actually a good thing that some people who were interested in the truth discovered that and tried to fix it. That actually the truth will come out eventually. And that like Jack says, if you hold views that are contrary to the truth, of course it's going to affect your decisions in some way. Maybe not always extreme ways like anti-Semitic propaganda, but in the things you say, in the way you behave, in the way you treat others, or even where you put your money, it will seep out in some way. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Should we move into how we actually combat some of these things then? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just take them as the, for the word. Right, so... There's a number of approaches we might take, right? We might approach them intellectually and philosophically or scientifically. We might approach them politically. We might do everyday things to share true information on the internet or something. But I suppose let's kick off with the first and most obvious solution. Let's assume that people can be motivated to change the views. Now, it's not going to be the case that people hold radical views who are really far gone, who are a part of a community, perhaps, which is self-sealed, I think the term Andrew used earlier. So I'm a part of the Facebook group Elvis Presley Isn't Dead. And it's a wonderful community where people share, like, the admin was really nice to me earlier. I was going to talk about the example, but it was so lovely. He messaged me, sent me some recommendations. He said, like, God bless you. I was like, this guy is so nice. And, like, they wish people happy birthday. They posted, like, a Friday happy Elvis song. It's a, it's a, you can see why people get sucked in. <laughs> I just want to be part of a community. This is the community for me. <laughs> but when people are isolated from their family and they've got this open-armed community cult-like thing, maybe arguments, sitting somebody down and, and explaining to them where they've gone wrong won't work. But take an example. This is a study in 2016 called Changing Conspiracy Beliefs Through Rationality and Ridiculing. Quote, rational and ridiculing arguments were effective in reducing conspiracy theories, whereas empathizing with the targets of conspiracy theories had no effect. Rational arguments targeting the link between the object of belief and its characteristics appear to be an effective tool in fighting conspiracy theory beliefs. So I said a second ago, let's assume, but we don't need to assume. People who are in the middle, when you sit down, the people on the fringes of believing conspiracy theories, if you sit down with them and show them the logical inconsistencies and the contradictions, then there's a chance, I'm not going to determine how strong the chance is, that they might shift back into the reasonable, let's say. And then if we take that and we look at, well, how do we avoid even that being necessary in the first place? I think it would be optimistic to think that we could do it successfully across all people. But Kassam suggests that one thing that we should be doing is teaching intellectual virtues from primary school level, let alone secondary school. And so skills in particular to do with critical thinking and even, I think with primary school kids, analyzing cognitive biases might, might be <laughs> tough. But you could come up with, I'm sure there must be activities and ways that you could get children to think about those things and more importantly, mm. value those things so that later on, they will know what questions to ask when it comes to a piece of information that they're reading. And we know that when students study things, in particular subjects like history, for example, but equally English lit and everything, where you analyze a text and you ask the right questions. You just, you just want to be mm. planting those seeds really early so that it becomes almost second nature. But I also know from reading around that we have that problem where you instantly want to believe that the thing you're reading is true. And so you have to second guess that automatic buy-in that your mind kind of wants to jump to, when it, and particularly if it's on a site that you already agree with a lot of the stuff. But Again, I don't see why you couldn't train that into a response that people think about early. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting answer. I think it's quite interesting to focus on education, primary and secondary, and think about how we can give young people the tools to be able to decipher the real conspiracies from capital C, capital T conspiracy theories. 
I also would say, and as we all know, we all work in education, that we know that actually the education system and the way we are encouraged to teach doesn't always lend itself towards that. And actually, in fact, mm. that when we do talk to a lot of students about certain topics, that actually what we are talking about does go against their intuitions, their base intuitions. We say, like, you, know, you need to be open-minded. You need to try and accept that some people think this, or actually you need to kind of accept that this is just, you know, that's what an atom is. And Kassam mentions in his book, doesn't he, that actually one of the problems with conspiracy theories is people being too open-minded. Like right. this problem that people are too accepting of like, oh, okay, cool, sure. Why not? Why can't an atom be that? And actually, they can't really discern between, no, this has some evidence and support behind it. And no, this is, you know, lizard people. So I think there's something in there too of being open-minded and Kassam warns not being too open-minded. You remind me of uh, that thing Gacy Graying told. So I forget who the quote's from. You want to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. Classic quote. On the theme of teaching still, I think another really important one that Kassam lists is the fact that some of the more detailed rebuttals of conspiracy theories are in books that the average person is never going to be able to read and a lot of people wouldn't even be able to access it. And so you want to have good public facing experts who can mm. disseminate information in a way that's digestible, understandable and in a way that they can relate to. And so whether that's using platforms online in the right way to be able to share this information is much more effective. If you write a huge tome on why the Nazis must have definitely carried out the Holocaust, it's fascinating for somebody studying history, and presumably everybody should know that knowledge. Can you expect somebody who's in the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories to dip into a book that might be 800 pages long, which is going to counter their beliefs that they hold? Uh, it's very debatable. <laughs> Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to the show's patrons for making this episode possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man making shed loads of money from his online conspiracy theory merchandise. It's Joe Richardson. The paranormal phantom stalking the minds of the paranoid. It's Mr. Jimmy Casperson. Teaching his students that Obama was born outside the USA and is in fact a Muslim. It's Justin Scurry. The flat earther who would drive off the edge of the earth before admitting the world is spherical, it's Mr. Chris Ford. Delighted that she got away with it, it's Mary Am Tavorby. Always wearing his tinfoil hat and putting up 5G masks, it's Neural Surge. He definitely wasn't standing near JFK with a dark grey umbrella, it's Rowan Grayson. Built on rocky foundations, it's the fortress of misleading facts that is Shane Castle. And last, but certainly not least, the one-man New World Order planning to rule the world through charisma and biceps alone, and boy does he have tons of both, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. So I'm really eager to actually give some of those tools now, right? So we're dancing around the issue and saying people should do this. So they should have public facing philosophy or critical thinking and education that tells people how to avoid conspiracy theories. I want to do that right here, right? And as public facing <laughs> philosophers, it's goodbye from the pan <laughs> We recommend a 1,000-page tome. <laughs> it's pop-pop philosophy quiz. <laughs> yeah. Here's the problem. There's no solution. I'm Karl Marx, and this is the pan <laughs> So the first thing to say, right, and here's some things if you're facing a conspiracy theory. I've got quite a few of these, but I want to pick out the main tools for thinking. And it's stuff we see constantly when we're doing philosophy anyway. Clarity is the enemy of conspiracy theories. They want to trade on vague assertions on lots of little problems, but throw loads out in one go. This is called the blunderbuss, I think the law calls this. So it's the idea that you throw out loads of problems, leave people to pick up the pieces in this kind of bad faith distraction argument, this red herring. But if you sit down with somebody, and it doesn't matter even if it's a conspiracy theory, and on the back of an envelope, jot down clearly and unambiguously what this person is saying and why they think it leads to the conclusion, then you will find the problems with the argument. So I do this constantly with people who I'm just discussing with casually and people find it really, really frustrating. They say, don't philosophize me. I'm just trying to give you my view and opinion. I just want to get a coffee, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm just going to serve you your coffee, sir. Can you please go away? Do you do this on all of your first dates? <laughs> <laughs> you questioning the waiter about his existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing to do is to put it down really simply and clearly what they're actually arguing. 
Well, I mean, I was going to say just as a, a funny thought that I had, I was like, I hope that no conspiracy theorists have ever read anything about Occam's razor, right? That the simplest solution is the most true. <laughs> Don't teach them that because that could lead them down lots of horrible paths. But yeah, absolutely. Jack's on it there. If you're struggling with deciding whether a, the idea you're discussing is a theory or a conspiracy or a conspiracy theory, yeah, drawing it down on a piece of paper, getting the person to explain to you, whether it's premise by premise or just stage by stage, how they've come to that conclusion. And actually, that's a really useful tool just for yourself. Why do you think what you think? Why do you have certain thoughts and feelings about certain issues? If you analyze your own thoughts and try and lay it out somewhat in a logical manner, it can actually show you quite a lot. Actually, no, I may, and I just take an example out of the sky. I may not believe in God, but maybe the reasons I don't believe in God aren't particularly valid or make much sense. Have I actually done the thinking behind the opinion? Because for most people, I, mean, I know you guys would agree with me on this. The opinion comes first and then people go back over and go actually justify it retroactively. Even Daniel Dennett says that's part of our evolutionary psychology, right? We make decisions and then justify them after the fact. Yeah, we found this with Robert Wright and some of the other evolutionary psychology, didn't we? People just act and then they give their justifications in hindsight. One of the key things I found with conspiracies, and as I'm sure you found as well, is they do something called piling up the anecdotes. So people love anecdotes, they're really attracted to them, everyone loves a good story. But I was thinking about this, and this is not to be overly critical of Bregman's book Humankind, but take this as an example, right? It's something we discussed on the show. There you've got loads and loads of anecdotes, one after the other, one after the other, and slowly you start to think, there must be something to this. So take the Christian scientist movement. So Christian scientists think that physical matter doesn't actually exist, and that all illness and disease and suffering is all in the mind. So what you need to do? You need to pray it out, right? The love of Lord will, <laughs> will set you on the right track. And by 1989, they collected 53,000 anecdotes of saying that this worked. Obviously confirmation bias, discounting the misses, counting the hits. So after reading 53,000 accounts, you might think, hey, this isn't crazy. Like There must be something to this. But we should be really, really skeptical when people pick out lots of anecdotes. With 8 billion people running around the world, 24 hours a day, if, you, you know, if, that, if you're very active, <laughs> then crazy things are bound to happen. You could pull out loads of anecdotes to support loads of different beliefs. So you need a preference towards hard data. In other words, I'm saying pink is right. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed from my reading, I'm sure you guys would agree as well, is this idea of anomalies. Conspiracy theories are based on anomalies, that there's some things that just seem really weird or bizarre or out of place, and that there must be a justification for this really weird, bizarre or out of place thing. And that actually, a lot of the academic research on conspiracy theory shows that people spot these anomalies, they notice these kind of mistakes in the pattern, and then use these very, very small things to go, ah, so there must be this big overall conspiracy theory based mm. around this tiny little anomaly. So we'll mention the JFK assassination a little bit later. There's a guy randomly during the JFK assassination wearing a very thick suit holding an umbrella on a very sunny day. And some people went absolutely crazy about this theory, thinking that, well, why would there be a guy wearing a thick suit and having an umbrella on a sunny day? Surely there must be some extreme explanation for this. But actually, there wasn't. It's an anomaly. An anomaly doesn't become the rule. Look at all the other hard data. Look at all of the footage of that assassination. Look at all the photographs. Look at the people. Surely something else has more evidence than just guy in thick suit with umbrella, therefore assassin. And often the case, like as you say, you find some anomalies, right? You find some gingerbread crumbs, some loose change, make an inductive leap. And it's really hard for us to identify when something has crossed the threshold from 49 to 51% probable, right? And I think that's one of the difficult things we all face. And conspiracy theorists in particular just can't gauge where it is on the scale of reasonability. Something is on the basis of the facts that's been presented to them. And especially now, right? So a brilliant quote here from psychologist Mike Wood, where he says, with the internet and a 24-hour news cycle that provide hundreds of hours of raw material that conspiracy theorists can kind of thrive on, he says, by sheer weight of numbers, there are bound to be some apparent inconsistencies and they can be seized upon and used as evidence against the mainstream narrative of the event. So if we're thinking about how to solve this problem, don't find an anomaly or a really random inconsistency and focus on that. Look at the big picture. If you look at the big picture, that will give you a fairer sense of what's actually going on instead of focusing on a micro detail in a photograph or in an image. So one example that Stephen Law gives in his book, uh, Believing Bull, which I highly recommend, I think you might need to believe that, Tyler, 
he likens it to religion a lot, but I want to pick out one which isn't drawing from a comparison with religion and conspiracy and intellectual black holes. On that theme of how do we decide whether a theory is credible, probable, whether it's unreasonable to believe it, one tactic conspiracy theories often employ is, but it fits. So it fits that my story fits the data that's been presented. This is a really low bar for a theory. We've spoken about you can double down with cognitive dissonance, you can explain it away into your theory. So contrary evidence comes along and you say, yeah, but they would say that because they're in on the conspiracy. So any data that's presented against you, you can collapse into your view. But also, conspiracy theories often fail to make clear, precise, surprising and true predictions. So suppose somebody says to you that you're going to meet a tall, dark and handsome stranger, says Law. Well, what does it mean to be handsome, tall, dark or when soon? Right? For strong confirmation, we need a specific prediction. You need to put your neck out on the line. It has to be surprising. So if I thought that the university professors in Liverpool were trying to kill me right, and you say, why do you think they're going to kill you? Say, well, they're teaching lectures, like they walk around campus wearing tweed. And during meetings, when I'm eating my pistachios, they glare at me. Right? You'd say, they were going to do that anyway. <laughs> That's not surprising. You're just fitting the data. So a stronger theory or, or one which is more credible or one that is able to be verified by the evidence has to make clear, precise, surprising predictions come across as true. One thing that probably came across your mind as you're reading is Karl Popper's falsification principle. So the falsification principle might not be very popular amongst philosophers, but it's surely a virtue of a theory. So a conspiracy theorist probably won't tell you under what criteria their theory would be proven false. And they can keep collapsing any data into that theory. Yet the alternative theory, the official view, will probably give you lots of examples of when their theory would collapse. Like if George Bush came out and said, yeah, 9 11 was an inside job, then that would be falsification. But what falsification can the 9 11 truther, quote unquote, give us. Karl Popper gives lots of examples that we've spoken about in the past. I think when we did our Freud series, I remember speaking to you, Andy, we were in a coffee shop in Birmingham and I fell victim of this uh, a very long time ago. I didn't see the problem in my own thinking. I thought, well, Freud's theory of psychoanalysis can explain loads of things, right? It's just unconscious. It was just there from the beginning. Like, it was just the Oedipus complex or whatever. Popper, quote from him, it began to dawn on me that this apparent strength was in fact their weakness. Here's a quote on Marx. In this way, they rescued the theory from refutation, but they did so at the price of adopting a device that would make it irrefutable. Marx said that they would rise up. They didn't rise up. So you just reinterpret the theory and show that it hasn't been falsified. Freudians do the same with their analysis, right? And this is a bad thing for a theory. A better theory gives the criteria. Yeah, well, I think that's a problem that many people have with a lot of either social sciences or perhaps not just parts, many elements of psychology. But I think there are limits to that. We can't say that just because Freud said things that might be too all-encompassing that we could throw mm -hmm. away absolutely everything that Freud had to offer. In the same way with Marxist analysis, yes, there has not been a big communist world revolution, but that doesn't mean his analysis of capitalism can't be right in certain places. I think you've touched upon both of you almost everything that I came across as well. I think just a couple of other basic questions that you could ask as conspiracy theorists are things like, how does the claim fit with our current understanding of the world? The more outlandish ones, uh, this is Hume's whole thing of, should I believe in miracle claims if I already have an understanding of how the natural world works? Well, if you're going to convince me that the earth is flat, you're going to have to tell me how all of the things I understand about the natural world are false. And equally, if I come to understand that actually the world is often a random place where people don't act with as much agency as I might assume, is that you're going to have to give me some really, really strong evidence for why, in this case, actually agency is the key thing. It ties into what Jack's been saying about you need to be really, really specific. And the more specific your questions are in that regard, the harder it is for any broad scope conspiracy theorists to be able to actually provide things. And then other ones are going to be things like just asking questions about what would it take to change your mind? I think that's a really important one. And if the answer is nothing, then well, <laughs> you might as well end the discussion there because no matter what emotional pull you try to provide or any logic or analysis or anything is not going to do anything. And you know that someone's being disingenuous if they wouldn't be prepared to change their mind no matter the evidence. 
yeah, I think you're bang on there, Andy. And I think it was quite interesting for me. I really like Sam's analysis and, and what we've discussed so far. But again, there's a bit of me, and I might sound like come as a bit arrogant here. There is a bit of me that also feels like just go and do the reading, right? Just go and do the reading. Because I think a lot of conspiracy theories are based on intuitions that upon further analysis are just wrong. One of the ones with JFK is that one bullet can hit two different people. A lot of the basis of the conspiracy theories is that people thought there was an extra shot fired by somebody else. And it wasn't. It was the second bullet that hit two people, right? And you can go and read Gerald Postner's book that he wrote in 1993. It's 600 pages long and there's a whole chapter dedicated to how one bullet can hit two different people. And yes, I could sit with you for five hours and explain to you the physics of how a bullet could ricochet, but I haven't got time to do that. It's actually sometimes, you know, appealing to the expertise there. You know, if you want to make a grand claim that there was a you know, some nefarious goings on there, actually saying, no, there's a piece of work you can engage with. It may be dense. It may be out of your comfort zone, but it does exist in the world and people have put work Mm. into it. And that book was actually written as a response to (laughs) conspiracy theories over the last 30 years that he was just fed up with of like, look, this is what actually (laughs) happened, right? And actually there is work out there you can engage with. I'm sure the same thing is true for 9-11, flat earthers and every other conspiracy theory you can think of. To an extent, I agree with you, but it goes back to that thing we were talking about with intellectual virtues, uh, as well as just mm-hmm. having the time or ability to be able to engage in certain things. I think saying just do the reading is nice if people have the time and the expertise to do so, but there are lots of people who just simply don't have the time to read a huge book about why a bullet can in fact do that. Now, of course, then you would hope that they would just trust other people's testimony who have read the book. And that's then about developing that trust amongst people. And that, I think, is the better answer to that. Because I think you can appeal to most people and get them to come around to trusting someone if they feel like that person is worthy of their trust. Whereas, can I train somebody who's already really far gone to actually want to read a book like that? I'm not even sure it could possibly be my job to do so. I think just a couple of things to finish up with in terms of a, like a toolkit for responding to conspiracy theorists is a couple of things to look out for and where alarm bells should be ringing. Here's a nice quote from Francis Bacon in his essay on truth. It's talking about Jesus and, and Pontius Pilate. What is truth, said the jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. I love that, like <laughs> as it happens in, in the New Testament. <laughs> what is truth? And he just he walks away before Jesus gives him an answer. And think about how people like Ben Shapiro or Alex Jones or some of these people on popular YouTube channels, and I think Alex Jones is banned from YouTube now, isn't he? But they speak really, really fast and they throw loads of stuff at you really quickly. They're not doing that in good faith and they're not doing that because it's good practice, right? They're doing it as a rhetorical device one, to keep you interested and engaged, but two, you can't spot the mistakes. Like what we've just said, you have to slowly break everything down on the back of an envelope if you can. And you should do this whenever someone's presenting anything which is contentious. So when they speak really fast, Pontius Pilate, they're off before you can explain to them what truth is. Yeah, and this became quite a big thing. I remember reading a journalist talking about dealing with fact-checking a lot of Trump's tweets or just comments that he would make on daily briefings is that if you are having to fact check every single thing, you're always constantly playing catch up. And as long as there's a steady stream of things that are ever questionable or outright false, is that you're never going to be able to do it all. And then it just creates that pool of impossibility. That's an interesting one because it just goes to show that if somebody is willing to say things that are completely misleading constantly, and particularly if they hold a seat of authority, it's actually really difficult to deal with that. And I think that really highlighted it, at least for people in the United States and anybody paying attention to US politics. Another thing which I found when looking through them is, I mean, I don't want to get too much into like critical thinking skills here, but a lot of them tend to state to us lots of very obvious, simple facts like, we're all children once, stand up tall, clean your room, right? stroke a cat. <laughs> and they'll tell stuff which seems like obviously true. Like, yeah, that would be good for me, right? And then they'll start to sneak in some more abstract and complex jargon, some things we're not quite as familiar with to get us on board. In the same way, like if you were to ask somebody a difficult question at a conference or something, you might start off by telling them things you agree with right, to get them on board. Or if someone asks you a difficult question, you explain the points that you do agree with and then you respond to them because they're much more receptible to the ideas that you're presenting. So don't expect a conspiracy theory to just be like, we've kind of presented it as Elvis is still alive or aliens are ruling the world. No conspiracy theory starts with that. They bring it up very slowly by pointing out things that are 
are obviously true. A last thing, and probably the most common thing, is something we touched on a lot in the previous section, which is, again, I'm borrowing this from Law, and I thought this was a great way of putting it, effing the ineffable. On the one hand, someone tells us that this thing is mysterious and unknown, a force which hasn't got our best interests in. Now you see it. But as soon as we ask any further clarificational details, as soon as we want names, as soon as we are sceptical of it, now you don't. Now it's hidden behind the scenes again. You see this play out in religious arguments, right? You might say, he's omnibenevolent, he's omnipotent. And then you present the problem, oh yeah, but he's beyond human understanding as well. Well, which is it? You're seesawing between ineffable and ineffable. And in the same lines you might find conspiracy theorists doing something very, very similar. Here's the mysterious thing behind the scenes. Oh, but you can't see it. Right. But you've just told me what it is and who it is. But oh yeah, but we, you don't know anything about them. So you should be really skeptical of this too. It's not the case that conspiracy theories on the whole, particularly radical ones, are going to be able to be tackled with these critical thinking skills that we've touched on there. Take the Bertha conspiracy, which floated by Donald Trump and people on the right against Barack Obama when he was elected. And constitutional requirement is the US that you're born on US soil. So what happened? Well, the certification of birth was confirmed by the governors, the state attorney general, and the chief of medical department in Hawaii. Then the Honolulu Star advertiser, the newspaper in Hawaii, released the edition of the week in which Obama was born, saying, birth this week, Barack Obama. And then third, the president released his actual long-form birth certificate. And people still believed it. Like a third of Americans still think that he wasn't born on US soil. And this seems like a clear example to me of where Kassam hits the nail on the head. This one is purely political. When Democrats are in power, Republicans will create conspiracy theories. But when Democrats are in power, Republicans will be more likely to pose conspiracy theories. You can take somebody down with a, a good story. And, and this seems to be a clear example of that. And the danger with that is that a birth certificate, okay, all of this evidence that Jack has just presented, and it made very little statistical difference in the opinion of many Americans. So like as Sam is saying, well, what's going on then? There's not just people interacting with these ideas and forming a logical argument and a conclusion. There is a almost like a vested interest in this theory. Is it the people around me are saying this and I'm kind of going along with it? Or people who look like me are saying this and I want to identify with them? And I definitely think that I agree with Jack 100%. He definitely bangs the nail on the head when you say, actually, yeah, this is a form of political propaganda. There's a reason why this theory wasn't created. This group of people didn't exist before Obama became president. It just didn't exist. It came afterwards. It was almost like a form of criticizing of his presidency. And then we've got to be really careful with that sort of thing and make sure, again, that we're using all of the skills that we've just mentioned to make sure that if we do get presented with this information, because it could have been that he may not have been born in America. That's not an unreasonable hypothesis. It could have been. Okay, well, where does the evidence lead us then? Do we actually have any evidence? No. In fact, we've got quite overwhelming evidence that it's a falsity. And then before you can come to a, a sensible conclusion on that. And I think the questions that people would want to ask about what motivates that particular political conspiracy. It's presumably, I think, a fair question to ask is, would somebody have asked the same question had they not been a black president? Because yeah. I just don't think that there had been many white Democrats who had been president of the United States prior to that point. So the fact that they're asking that question with this particular person cannot likely be a coincidence, can it? So that's part of the political message, as it were, that's within that conspiracy. And I don't think that's much of a stretch to say that. No, you're completely right. I think that's the obvious answer, right? That it's the color of Barack Obama's skin that leads people to think he's got Islamic sympathies or even like like that would be a bad thing or that he's not born on, on US soil. But the point I want to raise there is when someone says he's not a US citizen, Ollie, you mentioned something which perhaps a mistake that conspiracy theories make is that it's not an unreasonable assertion to make, they might think. From the get-go, it's by definition unreasonable because presenting a hypothesis, you have to have some reasons for holding it. You can't just invent it and say it fits the facts. You need reasons to think that it's true. Right? So it starts off at net zero and then you build it up. So this one starts off at net zero, it has all the evidence against it, yet still people hold it. It seems like a ludicrous view to hold. Yeah, I would agree 100%. I think that it's quite interesting, isn't it? The Bertha conspiracy, especially with the idea that he's Muslim, comes from the fact that his middle name is Hussein, which is obviously a, an Arabic name, right? So, okay, that's the worst evidence, the, the misunderstanding that people's names can change when people marry or, or move to different places all over the world. I mean, they would probably say, no, that's evidence enough for us to at least investigate the fact that he may be a Muslim because his middle name's Hussein. 
But I agree with you 100% there, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the idea that you would form hypothesis without evidence, again, you might as well just sit around and make stuff up, right? Like, why not just sit around and go, yeah, why doesn't this happen? Like, Margaret Thatcher's still alive and she's controlling the government. Have you got any evidence for that? No, but I just feel like it's true. Like, it just seems that way. Yeah, no, that's that's a nonsense. I want to pull myself up on that as well because I realise what I said probably isn't reasonable either and I want to make sure, Beanus was saying how to be good thinkers, I don't want to make the mistake of doing exactly what we're arguing against. So as we know, Clifford argues it is wrong always everywhere to believe anything on insufficient evidence. Well, this is false as well. I don't have sufficient evidence for all my beliefs. I don't have sufficient evidence for the microphones in front of me that the universe wasn't created five minutes ago or that you have minds, right? I have to take some things as properly basic. That doesn't mean you can go to war with Iraq on the basis of your gut, no. But I certainly can hold some basic truths without evidence. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you stopped yourself there and reflected instantly. I think on the theme of how do we hope ourselves to develop into better thinkers is to remember that this is part of a process of learning. I certainly don't think of myself as being a particularly great thinker. And I'm sure I've said many things in the almost 100 episodes of this show where (laughs) if I was to listen back to it now, I'd be thinking like, wow, did I really say that? Or did I think that? Or was I just (laughs) kind of just chucking stuff out there because we're recording stuff? Was that cafe a dream? (laughs) Partly then is that this should be considered an ongoing process. You're not going to become a better critical thinker after reading one critical thinking book or listening to a couple of podcasts. You have to engage with it directly, presumably daily, weekly, and over time, you begin to spot your own thinking and your own issues. That's, I think, a a really important takeaway is if you suspect that some of your ideas are flawed, spend a lot of time on it, read a lot of books, listen to a lot of things and do it daily. Yeah, I couldn't echo that more. I think Andy's bang on the money there. I think in society, we're often told education is something that happens when you're younger and it happens by someone telling you things. Well, no, not necessarily. You can be autodidactic. You can go and read lots of different sources, come to your conclusions and don't be in a hurry to do it. And be honest with yourself. If you thought something was true and you found some contrary evidence and you change your mind, that's okay. There doesn't need to be any shame. There doesn't need to be any regret. I mean, if you did things that were bad based on those false beliefs, potentially, but actually, yeah, be honest with yourself. You know, we all, as we go through our lives, our opinions will hopefully change. I'm glad I don't hold the same opinions I did now when I was 16, because quite frankly, (laughs) they were abhorrent, just like me. But uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a process and it will change for your whole life. And that's something to embrace and just keep working at it little by little. Don't put pressure on yourself to be like, I have to critically evaluate it. Like, what am I doing buying plastic in a supermarket? Like, okay. Sure, like you can sit and think about it, but don't, don't like go into the underground man's like m- conscious inertia of choice and information. You know, take it one step at a time, and you'll you'll be fine, dear listener. You'll be okay. <laughs> Actually, That's oh, such a mixed uh, message. You were like, be critical thinking, but don't critical think too much. But just about the right. Don't worry, you'll be fine. You've got the. Imagine what my lessons are like, Jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, one one thing I wish I'd said way back when we were talking about the psychology stuff, but it's just suddenly popped into my head because of some of the stuff that Ollie was saying there is the almost desperate need we sometimes have to be consistent with our views. And if we said something or believe something that we will continue to hold on to that for perhaps much longer than its sell by date. And it's because it becomes part of who we are. And if we admit we're wrong, then we have to also admit that I'm an inconsistent person. And to admit that I'm an inconsistent person means that I might be an unreliable person and that people might not trust or like me very much. And it all comes Mm. part into that wider sense of our identity. Something that might be something as simple as an idea that I have is actually far more important than that, depending on the idea. We should be critical of ourselves when it comes to our consistency and maybe be more accepting of the fact that we, a lot of the time, probably are very inconsistent. So a final thing I wanted to mention this thing, just maybe your, your thoughts uh, briefly on it, because it's a solution that's posed in some of the texts and free speech is a big part of the public consciousness as it always has been and perhaps always should be. I was reading John Stuart Mill's On Liberty in the Kitchen Sink last Humble night brag. and I came across the <laughs> passage thing which in the kitchen sink yeah because I haven't got a bath only because I'm because the man took it from me um, <laughs> in a spaceship <laughs> saying from his bourgeois apartment <laughs> <laughs> don't speculate those conspiracies Andrew I think we're, we're, uh, we don't need those stories so What's the point I was going to make? Well, John Stuart Mill says in On Liberty that we should make sure that we not only let people voice whatever opinions they have, but give them platforms to do so. So it's not just that you're allowed to say whatever you like as long as it doesn't cause direct harm, but at the same time, we should allow those people to have a platform to say those views. 
Is one of the solutions here just to stick our middle finger up to DeMille, as I'm sure he wouldn't mind, it's a free speech after all, <laughs> and say, no, we're not going to have conspiracy theorists on the radio. Like, we're not having Holocaust deniers on the radio. We're not having 9-11 conspiracy theories on Channel 4. And why? Because it gives credibility to them and they're not credible. Yeah, there's been a lot of said about this in the last few years. And for those of you not in the UK, there's been a lot of talk about a law that's kind of in the process of being passed about free speech on university campuses and what people should be allowed to say. And my mind on this keeps changing. I'm not really sure where I'm committing my position to, but I think there is at least some type of things where having them on really public forums doesn't serve much use. So one of the things I, I will stand by is say that particularly with things like climate change, the science is so overwhelmingly there that to have a climate denier on a mainstream show does nothing for the discourse. It's utterly pointless. You would say that, Andrew, you're part of the conspiracy. <laughs> well, so when there is a huge scientific consensus on something, hearing another side of things isn't about the intellectual forum, the marketplace of ideas. It does nothing to help that. And I think that new shows have typically done okay recently of not doing that, but I think it still happens. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends, right? So in the UK, we have the BBC, which is supposed to be, quote, unbiased in its presentation of views. And they often have to balance out certain opinions by getting on certain guests. And I think sometimes having a guest on a show whose opinions are a bit strange can almost quell them completely. We, we joked in the previous episode about the Alex Jones interview on the BBC. You could not watch that and go, wow, that <laughs> seems, like, seems like a really legitimate kind of okay theory. I'm totally going to go research Alex Jones now and get really into his stuff. Like, no, he just comes across like a lunatic. I thought the BBC are trying to silence him. Yeah, it was controversial, wasn't it? As uh, Nick Griffin was on Question Time, uh, was, well, it must be like 10 years ago now. And there was a big controversy about that. He was the leader of the British National Party, which is very outspoken racist views and strange conspiracy theories about Asian rape gangs and stuff like this. And the same thing, like he came across as just a numpty and the, the party folded within like a year, I think, of that interview. So sometimes, yes, you are giving a platform in a sense, but sometimes it can really highlight bad ideas and remove them from the discourse. But I probably know what Andy's going to say in response to that, I think. Well, my initial response to those two examples is actually, I don't think that they were invited on in good conscience. So Alex Jones being interviewed by Andrew Neil was not about sharing views equally and giving airtime in that way. Because at the end of that interview, Andrew Neil is making silly faces into the camera and <laughs> openly mocking his, his interviewee. So in that case, the, the message is clear to the viewer is look at this complete quack and look at how silly he looks and let's all invite ourselves in to laugh at the silly person. As long as that's up front, then fine. But I don't think that that is the same as providing a platform equally with two people and treating them as if they are the same. And equally, I think you could possibly say the same thing about the Nick Griffin one is that I, it's been a really long time since I remember watching the question time when he was invited on. But I remember a lot of the questions, both from audience members and from the panel, were very negative. So it wasn't like he was open, he wasn't brought on there to be able to give his views. But I might be wrong about that. It's been a while. Invite Alex Jones onto. Oh, do. I mean, I totally interview Alex Jones. <laughs> you can. We'd be banned from all of the like Spotify and iTunes and everything. Ollie, you go woke, you go broke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in, in the case of this show, that is entirely true. <laughs> Yeah, peddling left wing propaganda yeah. as uh, one of our recent iTunes reviews. <laughs> I mean, like to to be as upfront about that. I mean, like I think most of the, at least our analysis of things probably is more left leaning, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, we've always yeah, tried. We're to be. impartial, Andrew, and anything otherwise is a conspiracy theory. Something that isn't a conspiracy theory is mystery philosopher. The mystery philosopher. It's not a conspiracy theory. There is a answer to the mystery philosopher, as always. Yes, their voice is muffled, but with a little bit of uh, critical thinking, you'll be able to find out who <laughs> the ghost in the machine is. Here's the mystery philosopher for this week. Embrace who you are. The truth is in your hands. Cast away the beliefs of the masses. Embark on the journey now. Don't hesitate. Embrace. 
I swear that's being read by Greg, but I'm not sure who the actual philosopher is. <laughs> it's, it's read by me. But, uh, I say, oh no, uh, let, let's uh, let's no, it's not. It's never read by me. They're all mystery <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> So you, so you said it was a, a philosopher, a philosopher, living or dead? Living. No, sorry, I, I couldn't. I actually can't guess. I have no idea. Stephen Law. It's not Stephen <laughs> Law. No, I made that one up. That was uh, that was a conspiracy. Oh, that was nobody. so I got it right. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Andrew. Wilson. I thought it was Greg. <laughs> and conspiracy theories do happen, Olive. You learn nothing. I say that with confidence because I have read every book from every philosopher. And, and I came to the conclusion that it wasn't in any of their books or any of their interviews, Jack. I should have used more critical thinking skills. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the PanSciCast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash PanSciCast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Excellent. That was great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>